Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Pat Gallagher, CEO of Arthur J. Gallagher & Company. Pat, nice to see you. Thank you, Andy. It's great to be here. So why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about the company. It's one of the nation's largest insurance brokers, but I read that the company provides brokerage and risk management services. But what does that really mean exactly? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, we're an insurance brokerage enterprise. We're not a risk-taking enterprise. We're not an insurance company. And we really provide three things. Property casualty insurance advice, anywhere from down to a homeowner's policy all the way to the largest companies in the world. We also provide advice on employee benefits, life insurance, pensions, those types of things, health insurance, again, from personal life insurance all the way through large accounts. And thirdly, we have a business that pays claims, typically claims for self-insured parties. So think about large companies or large entities, a university, a large trucking firm that takes a big layer of self-insurance. Someone has to come in and pay those claims. We do that. At the same time, we also offer insurance companies those services. So if they want to enter a market they're not in, go to a geography that they're not present in, we come in and pay the claims on their behalf. So your grandfather founded the company, what, almost 100 years ago, and I think it was 1927, something along those lines. Yep. And you're the third generation Gallagher family member CEO, and yet it's a public company. So how does that work? What's the ownership, and how are you all, is your family involved? Well, it's interesting. My, my grandfather, as you said, started the business in 1927, loved this business, uh, felt that it was incredibly important, and brought his three sons in late 40s, early 50s, and they in turn loved the business and grew it, got into, in the 60s, this whole concept of self-insurance. And that took us on a path to pretty extensive growth. And I give my dad and uncles a lot of credit in that they realized if we were going to continue this path of growth, they needed a currency to do acquisitions. And so in 1984, at $60 million in total revenue, uh, the company went public. And uh, we raised a whopping $11 million, uh, ended the year with a $79 million market cap, and that was the launching pad to go get other entrepreneurs to join us. In those days, in the middle 80s, we did our acquisitions on what was known at the time account accounting rules under pooling of interests. We were able to essentially trade equity with you and have no expense to our P&L and no goodwill to our balance sheet. It was a restatement of your assets and liabilities and mine together back 10 years. Those rules have changed, but nonetheless, that currency is what gave us the opportunity to build out our platform by buying primarily smaller brokers than we were with basically the understanding of, look, Andy, you don't need to sell. You've got a very successful firm, and we don't need to buy you. But if you become Gallagher in your town, maybe your family's assets and my value can double faster together than we can apart. And that model's actually worked. It's worked extremely well. We're probably about seven or 800 acquisitions in since 1984. Surprisingly enough, I think it's fair to say that less than 5% of those have been failures, mm -hmm. which is a pretty darn good track record, which proves up the point that we're not just a roll-up company. We're not just out buying brokers and keep your name and everything else. We're forming and building a company. Along that period of time, our family, in terms of its ownership of the business, was substantially diluted because we were trading equity for equity. And yet, at the same time, from an operating standpoint, the family was important to the enterprise. I sat with my grandfather and remember listening to him talk about this business. I joined in 72 as an intern, 74 full-time. That year, we were about $6 million in revenue. I've got children and others that have kids in the business that have joined us through this process of acquisition, and they together are taking this thing to the next level. So it's a, uh, it's a business that's worked extremely well, both for shareholders as well as for all these families that we bought. So that's a, that's a very important point. When we did an acquisition, number one, we don't synergize out the costs by getting rid of the principals. The idea was Andy, you and your family have built a great business. Let's put them together. Now we're bringing capabilities and you're bringing local contacts. Let's do this thing together. Let's have fun with it. And it's worked extremely well. So there's still a very strong family undercurrent. There's very strong family involvement, but the ownership is not Gallagher family. Right. That's a fascinating story. And 
So, you know, one might think that you have a controlling interest, not the case at all anymore at this point. Not at all. But there are some younger Gallagher's in the business still. There's a, there's a, a number of them. Right. Not just my direct descendants, but others. And talk to us about the, the best opportunities that you see going forward for Gallagher. You mentioned that the self-insurance piece. Is that the best part or where? I don't mean to be flip here, but I do think it's everywhere. And the reason I say that is this. The industry is huge. It's incredibly important. Uh, people tease about insurance as A, being boring, B, being you know not very creative. It's a bunch of guys in suits and ties. They can't get out of their own way. It's never changed. It's ripe for all this new insure tech and fintech and all the rest of it. The fact is that insurance is the oxygen of commerce. It's not the oil. It doesn't just grease the wheels. You don't have insurance, you don't trade. You don't send a ship across the ocean. You don't build a house. No insurance, no business. Hugely important. It's an incredibly large industry. About $7 trillion of premium floats around the globe spreading insurance and risk. So when you look at that, you go, wow, it, it's really, really incredibly important. And so when you take a look across that entire spectrum, from the smallest operator being maybe that person that just owns their house, all the way up to middle market accounts that really are building the American and global economy, all the way to huge risk management accounts, on that entire spectrum, their need continues to grow. New risks happen every year. 10 years ago, we never ever talked cyber. Nobody knew cyber. Today, we got to deal with AI on top of cyber. Mm -hmm. Weather risk is becoming a huge factor. So all of that means that dealing with the risk of, a, of, of an enterprise, being able to go to bed at night as the owner of a middle market company and say, something happens tonight, I'm still in business, becomes more and more important as the, as the world economy grows. I want to ask you, you mentioned weather, I want to ask you about climate change. And, you know, you, you're right, we're seeing changing weather, we're seeing, you know, air turbulence. I mean, all these things are percolating. Hard necessarily to point, you know, this caused that, but something is clearly going on. And I'm wondering what you're seeing in terms of claims, premiums, how are you thinking about climate change? Well, I'm not a weatherman, but I think everybody that's around understands. Oh, I grew up in the Midwest. We never had tornadoes in the fall, ever. Tornadoes were a, were a spring event. So here we are, that's happening. More and more of this convective storm stuff is just destroying parts of our country alone, not to mention the rest of the world. Every day you pick up the paper and you see floods and what have you, whether it's freezing and flooding in Houston or wherever it might be. I think pretty much science does tell us that that's around global warming. So what does that do to the insurance industry? Well, it makes it a huge part of the conversation. So I'll give you an example. We might have a large account, many manufacturing plants, and they're going to sit around a conference room and decide where they're going to put their next plant. They want to turn out 100,000 widgets a month, and they need a spot to do it. Well, weather and nether came into that equation 10 years ago. Earthquake might have, uh, fire maybe, but not like we see in California. So what you've now got is the conversation, one of the risks on the wall that needs to be discussed before we decide our location is weather. And I think that's, you know, the fact that you're asking me about it is just exactly an example of that. Right. The stock has been a home run long term since, what, 84? And it's done pretty well since you became CEO, what, in 95, that's right. I believe? Last year, it's, well, shareholders are spoiled because last year it kind of merely matched the market. Like, what have you done for us lately? So what's, what's been the story about the long-term success of the stock? And then what's going on this year where you're, you know, merely matching? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm not a stock market guy. Stock markets come and they go. You know, I learned from my uncle and from a guy that was a mentor of mine, who your listeners will remember the name of Bob Baldwin. Bob Baldwin was chairman emeritus of Morgan Stanley, mm -hmm. very, yeah. very influential on Wall Street. Yeah. Bob was a mentor of mine because he was on our board after we came public. And he said, Patrick, don't ever worry about the daily stock price. Build a company, and I will tell you, there'll be days when people want more of it than they can get. And there'll be other days when they don't. So stocks go up and down because there's more buyers than sellers. And I know that's simplified, but the fact is we're building an enterprise over the long haul that gets recognized in spurts. 
And that's because people play markets hard and soft. They do this, they do that. And if we just concentrate on building a really great company that has great growth prospects, and when you take a look at this $7 trillion and realize that I have 30,000 competitors in America, these are firms, not people, that do not have my capabilities. They have no data. They have no analytics. They've got no capabilities on a global basis. And I've got no market share. What's the value of that stock long term? Well, when we came public, the value was $79 million. Today it's $54 billion, and we're just getting started. You talk about these acquisitions. You've made hundreds of them. Presumably that's going to continue. You're going to continue to make acquisitions. Did you benefit from the long decline in low interest rates, and now does that become more challenging in a higher rate environment? Uh, well, I think, look, anytime interest rates go up, it's got a positive and a negative effect on us, frankly. It makes our debt costs a little bit more expensive, but at the same time, it increases underneath the purchase of insurance all the exposure units. Payrolls go up, sales have to go up, property values go up, and that turns into insurance premium, which benefits us. Also, what happens in inflation is that your clients are looking for guidance around costs, around insurance. What am I going to do? Well, I, am I going to stay with the Jones Insurance Agency in Glenview, Illinois, and just take whatever the Hartford or Travelers tells me I need to take? Or am I going to step back and talk to somebody like Gallagher that says, no, 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 self-insure this line, place this line overseas, let's bring this thing together and mitigate that cost while at the same time improving your coverage, not decreasing the coverage. So all of a sudden the professional capabilities become more important. So yes, it does push our costs up on the one side, but it increases our opportunities on the other. Wait, I'm sorry, can you explain to me how you pay someone for being self-insured a, a claim? I, I'm sorry, I don't quite get that. So let's take, for instance, probably one of the public entities that you live in. Mm -hmm. They will likely take a large deductible. So think of self-insurance as a large deductible. You could buy your auto insurance with no deductible. Hmm. That'll cost you a lot more money. Right. Chances are you got a thousand or five thousand dollar deductible, and that'll click in at a cost that you and your wife go, yeah, I'll take that. That's exactly the same thing. So if you've got a large public sector client, for instance, they're likely to take a hundred thousand dollars of any claim that happens to them, whether it's a snowplow runs into your car, someone falls down their steps. Well, if they do that, they need somebody to come in and pay claims. That's where Gallagher Bassett comes in, paying claims with your money. In other words, the public entity's money. Right. They set up a checking account. It's their money. We basically have a checkbook. It's all electronic. And we pay the claims for the person that fell down the steps. By the way, we adjust that claim. So we help them get to the right doctor, help them get back to work, take care of the claim. And we feel we can prove that we do that better than the industry does. What are your customers telling you about the economy right now, Pat? You mentioned is, clients. Thank you for asking that, Andy. This is a really interesting one, and it's one we look at as a future real opportunity. We have the data and analytics today to be able to tell you what happened to our client base in the world economy and in the United States every single day. We track audits, which is what happened during the year. Did your, did your business go up or down? Do you owe more, more money to the insurance company? We track endorsements. Are you adding buildings and cars to your business? And we track cancellations. Are you canceling the policies? And that gives us a real window into what's going on in the world economy of the middle market unreported on Wall Street. Our businesses and our middle market clients are booming. And one of our, one of our quarterly conference calls, I actually got asked the question, I was being pressed, and I said to the questioner, I said, I read all the same publications you do. Our data is telling us that our clients in the middle market are doing well. No recession. Six months later, those same people are saying, hey, guess what? Your data was right. So what we're seeing today is audits are up, cancellations are down, endorsements are up. That means in that huge middle market, which is defined by literally anybody that pays more than, let's say, $100,000 for insurance, all the way up to millions, that business is doing extremely well. So what do you think about, we had mentioned interest rates before, what do you think about rates right now in terms of where they might be headed and the economy? What's your personal take on both of those topics? So first of all, I think interest rates will come down because I think, and I don't know the mechanics of this, I think they're very politically charged. And anything that's very politically charged 
I think is subject to all kinds of whims and what have you. And what the Fed does, I can't pretend to understand that. So I think interest rates will probably tend to come down. And we are seeing the, the, the public information around inflation is that it's improving. I think if you looked at those people out in the field, they would probably tell you inflation isn't improving all that much. But again, that's for someone else. As all this relates to our business, the world's getting riskier every day. People need to deal with that risk. What are we going to do about deep fakes, Pat? What happens when the call comes in from my CFO? It's not the CFO. What if my client calls me and tells me to send me back my million dollars? And it's not my client. Deep fakes, AI, cyber, the attacks, we were breached, and we had to be public about that so I can talk about it. After we were breached, the attacks on our systems went up hundreds of percentage. Someone out there said they got in. Let's see, we can get in. Bam, 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 bam. So when I look at all of that from a macro standpoint, our business just becomes more important right down to the little guy every day. Pat, what do I do with this? Let me help you. A, we look at how do you prevent it. We don't just insure everything. You can't. So Andy, look, let's make sure that you're locking the gates on your lot so that your cars don't disappear overnight. You got a great dealership. You happen to be in a place where people steal cars or catalytic converters. Oh, okay. That's not insurance. And then let's figure out what you need to insure and make sure it works. So I'm a customer out there, and I got an Aon guy over here, a Marshall McLennan guy over here, a WTW guy over here. Why am I going with your company, Pat? Well, I tell you what, those are all great companies, and they're all incredibly capable. So I'd have to tell you that the one thing I'm very proud of, and I believe this is a differentiator, of course we all will say that we've got terrific capabilities, and we do. I think what we bring to the table better than anybody in the world is our ability to get that capability at the point of sale, at the point of need, faster and more directly than anyone. You go, how's that, Pat? I do believe we have a differentiator in our culture. I think our culture is a culture where you pick up the phone and ask for help, people answer. You say you've got an opportunity, people run to it. You say you have a problem with a client, people will help you out. And I'm very, very proud of that. I think it goes back to your earlier comments about the family. We like each other. By the way, all these acquisitions that I'm talking about, 99% of them were family businesses. They brought their kids in. The principals have moved on. A lot of those businesses are still run by their kids. They want this thing to work. So I don't mean to overstate it, but I think that as I get older, what I realize is the single most important thing in the success or failure of any organization. I don't care if it's Barron's, I don't care if it's Dow, I don't care if it's your church or your club, it's culture. Maybe this follows that then, Pat. You've been CEO, it's getting towards 30 years now. What do you like most about this job? Well, Andy, if you said to me I could go and play bridge today or spend time with Andy, I'm happy to be here. I think it's just a, it's the greatest business on the planet. Really, I mean that. I think it's the most important business, short of those that deal with our medical needs and our first responders. I get that. But when you take a look at whether or not it's raising money or whatever, to me, insurance is really at the crux of giving people the opportunity to grow forever. And I just get excited about it every day. And what we do for society, you talk about climate change, Florida gets wiped out, who puts that back together? It's not the federal government, it's us. So to me, every single day is exciting. I get to interact with people that I really admire and would never have maybe had a chance to meet. And we do something that's really important. I'm not going anywhere. Pat Gallagher, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you, Andy. This is At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll catch you next time.